Hey, what's up, y'all? Back at it once again. It's a Koski of Fun Day. You know what I'm saying? Dropping this time history, you know, African history you and yours. And we're going to talk about a cat that's not really talked about that much, Henry William Garnett. We're going to go to one of his um, speeches to show why he's not talked about that much, you know. Out of the three men from this era, the main one is known as Frederick Douglass, you know. But the other two, Martin Delaney, who we got a video about, and this guy right here, Henry William Garnett, are the other two trains of thought that's not really spoken about or really discussed amongst African people. So we're going to bring this ancestor on out and discuss one of his things that he was talking about. As you see, here's a picture of him. You know what I'm saying? Got the mun chops and whatever, you know, from the style from back in the day. And, um... We should really, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, we're going to read more about this ancestor and find out why he's not really that discussed. All right, now, this is uh, The Slave as an Abolitionist. William Highland Garnett, excuse me, I said Henry. Henry Highland Garnett addressed to the slave of the United States of America. All right, this is by Harry Reid. Henry Highland Garnett was born December 12, 1815 on William Spencer Plantation in Kent County, Maryland. At age nine, he and his family escaped slavery and was out of the year in New Hope, Pennsylvania. In 1825, Mr. Garnett Sr. moved the family to New York City. It was there that Garnett got his early education at the African Free Schools and the High School for the Colored Youth. In 1835, Henry admitted to the Noyes Academy, Cannon, New Hampshire was forced by mob action to pursue other educational plans. So they was racist there in New Hampshire too. You know, this, um, who else went to this school? Um, Cromwell, you went to this school. I listened to Cromwell, same thing happened to him. By 1840, he had completed his education at Odina Institute, Weisboro in New York, under the tutelage of Reverend Bayer Green. Prior to the Civil War, Garnett life was, was active and varied. In 1839 to 1840, he was a leading supporter of the newly found Liberty Party. In 1840, he co-edited a number of newspapers, including the National Watchman in 1848. In 1848, Garner was honored by the Daughters of Temperance, and he published Davis Walker Appeal with his own speech, an address to the slaves of the United States of America. And later in 1850, he attended the Peace Conference in London. Before the end of his life, he served as a missionary in Jamaica, as to serve volunteer check chaplain to black troops in the Union Army, and as president of Avery College in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. On May 4th, 1882, Reverend Alexander Cromwell, speaking for the Unary, Union Literary and Asso Historical Association of Washington, D.C., utilized in glowing terms his late friend and associate, Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, American minister to Liberia. Garnett, who had inspired in Monrovia on the 13th February, was, Carmel said, a man of wondrous qualities and astonishing elegance of strong and various commanding character and long continued philanthropies and labors of great virtues, a true genius, a most illustrated example of the capacity of the Negro race and the dignity of man. Cromwell might have added that Garnett was also one of the most controversial, the controversial of the American abolitionists. Garnett's conventional nature is beyond the scope of this essay. Instead, we argue here of his major speech addressed to the slaves of the United States of America, containing two elements that mark him as most, one of the most original American anti slavery thinkers. First, an analysis of the address will demonstrate that Henry Highland Garnett utilized and reflected to the soundest degree major general concepts of antebellum reform and thought in the 1830s and 1840s. And most particular, more particular, Garnett used the ideas of Garrisonian perfectionists. These included the proposition that slavery and slaveholding were a moral sin, and that an entire nation shelled the guilt for their continued existence. That the perfectibility of man was desirable and possible, that a moral attack would bring the destruction of slavery, and that the individual moral argument had had more consensus in order to be effective. And second, for Garnett discourse, will be constructed a program of emancipation, the first of its kind for abolitionist Rostam, that advocated the use of slaves as active agents in his own liberation. The final acts in the step three of the plan does envision a bloodbath in the South. 
by that perception of this final phase is fundamentally a scheme of militant self-defense. His contemporary responded negatively towards the radical violence. Simultaneously, they dismissed miss the uniqueness of the offering and represented his ideas. Two sacrosanct is probably accounted for in a misrepresentation. One, the documentation of event was incredibly thin, and two, the emotional reaction to the addresser in Garnett's impassioned responses to the criticism was scared him to the real thrust of his offering. Benjamin Coros has offered a plausible reason for the lack of documentation. The Alan Bellum, white media, especially the Southern press, had to ignore the black Alan business or they would have unhinged an cardinal tenet of the Southern faith. The concept that the content slave and passive and black. Not even the liberator, which had a reporter in attendance, published the text. In 1848, five years after the event, Garnett published his talk at his own expense. During a five-year hiatus, Garnett and some of his contemporaries engaged in argument his argument about his intentions. Minutes of the meeting proceeding offered an example of the emotionalism of the moment. Garnett had asked for and had received a special ruling which allowed him to speak for almost one and a half hours. He concluded amidst great applause and the whole convention literally in tears. Several days of heated debate followed and ended in a rejection of the address by the margin of one vote. Such a conflict centered around the phase, then to strike for liberty, ready for war to the knife and a knife to the hill. E.A. March of the Literary reported that the intensity of the discussions. This report described the threats to the chairman, name calling and inflammatory, but unrecorded second speech by Garnett, and Garnett later repudiated March in his coverage of the convention. On the convention floor, Frederick Douglass said there was too much physical in the speaker in speech, and that he was trying moral means a while longer. Douglass grabbed the fundamental idea about Garnett offering that escaped the attention of the contemporaries and the historians. Garnett did not specifically propose an insurrection. But he advised a plan, pursuing a plan that would participate revolt. Marie Weston Chapman did not make the Douglas distinction. She asked instead if Garnett had ever found Christ calling for the war to the knife, or if he, Garnett, thought the gospel was in harmony with his address. Mrs. Chapman applauded the rejection of the address because it indicated that black men could be exponents of love, freedom, and forgiveness. Both Miss Chapman and Douglas received Garnet Aiden Nation criticism for their opposition. He did not respond to the substance of criticism, but argued his right to speak to have the question of slave liberation. To Douglas, he retorted that he had only advised slaves to go to their master and tell them what they, they wanted their liberty and had to come, had come to ask for it. And if their master refused, tell them then we shall take it and let the conscience be what it may be. Garnett assured Ms. Chatlin that there is one Black American who dares speak boldly on the subject of universal liberty. His reaction to Chap Mrs. Chapman's materialism, excuse me, maternalism was undeniable, but did little to satisfy clarify what Garnett's speech actually advised. Much of the speech's significance stands from an unmistakable assertion of a Black point of view. It was most frequently discussed and consistently distorted characteristic of the address. Most historians have seen out the phrase, you have better, you have far better all die, die immediately, than live as slaves, as an illustration of a militant call to arms. The phrase, however, is lifted out of context and most important in the clarifying Garnett's assertions. This is from the speech. Think how many tears you have poured upon the soil which you have cultivated on records of toil. Unrich with your blood and then go to your lordly enslavers and tell them plainly that you are determined to be free. Appeal to their sense of justice and tell them that you have no moral right to oppress you than you have to enslave them. And treat them to the move, remove the grievous burdens which have been imposed upon you and remunerate you for your labor. Promise them renewed diligence in the cultivation of the soil if they render you an equal covenant for your services. Then tell them in language that they cannot misunderstand for all the sinfulness of slavery and the future judgment of and of the righteous rebellion against the ignorant God. Inform them that all you desire is freedom and nothing else will suffice. Do this and forever cease to toil for the heartless tyrants who give you no other reward but stripes and abuse. 
if they did commence the work of death, they, and not you, were responsible for consequences. For I had all better of you die and die immediately than live slaves and entrail your wretchedness upon your prosperity. The quote contained qualifications and appeal to the sense of justice and treat them to remove, promise them renewed diligence and severely compromise any revolutionary intent. The initiator of violence will be the masters, not the slaves. While maintaining it would be better to die as free men than to leave as slaves, Garnett never encouraged the slaves to begin an armed conflict. Quite the contrary, Garnett warned the slaves that revolt would not find support because the spirit of the age and the gospel was opposed to war and bloodshed. And finally, we do not advise you, he said, the attempt of revolution by the sword because it be inexpedient. Without any disclaimers of violence, and I indicated that he was exposed to and influenced by the ideas of Alabama reform that permeated American society in the years 1830 to 1865. His address manifested an overwhelming belief in the sinfulness of a particular institution. It was, in Garnett's case, a logical, rational belief that he had nurtured for many years and more consequences that Garnett had precisely the same words in his orientation that may be written as the first Alabama statement. In this speech, Garnett advised slaves to tell them, slaveholders, in a language which they could not misunderstand, for their seen sinfulness of slavery. Nine years later, nine years earlier, as a founder, as a secretary of the Garrison Literary and Benevolent Society in New York City, Garnett had corresponded with the editor of The Liberator. There, Garnett explained the society's name was a small token of respect for Garnett persons and services on behalf of the oppressed. In Garnett's opinion, Garrison's most important service was showing slaveholders the seeing sinfulness of slavery. Garnett's adherence to this idea remained strong, very strong, and was reinforced in 1835 when he became a student at Ohio Institute in Whitesboro, New York. There he was influenced by Byer Green, president of Ohio and a leading clergy, biblical scholar, educationist, and abolitionist. Green may have had the most important influence on Garnett early years. During Garnett's first year at Ohio, at Odata, Green wrote a scathing review of the pro-slavery article by the professor of Christian theology at the Union Theological Seminar. Green characterized slaves as one of the greatest sins which disgrace and afflicts a bunch of our country. Garnett struck out against the slave master in much in the same vein. Closely associated with the idea of slavery as a sin, which second presents its theme in Garcinian abolitionism the idea of collective guilt. So this is where white guilt comes in from. You know, the whole race as a collective should feel guilty. The intellectual roots of this concept came principally from the old Protestant sense of public morality and the individual responsibility for maintaining the public welfare. It followed, therefore, that Northerners who were not actively calling for the eradication of slavery were as guilty as the owners. Speaking for before Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, in 1833, Dr. Charles Fulton reminded the entire nation of its culpability. The guiltiness of the existence of slavery within the bounds of federal legislation rests upon every citizen who has not exerted himself to the utmost by free discussion and petitions to Congress that this cruel and disgraceful insisticity may be removed. The logical but simplest conclusion that they were all guilty who allowed slavery to exist while working for us in minds was precisely a guide by Angelique Grind. We hold, she said, that the North is guilty of crime of slaveholding. We assert that it's a national sin. Whether Garnett ever heard the pronouncements of Mrs. Gaffney or Dr. Fulton is not important. What is important is the currency of the idea that the fact that Garnett espoused it. Speaking in the poetic and religious terms of that address, Garnett indicted the church for its complicity. The bleeding captive pled his innocence and pointed to Christianity, who stood weeping at the cross. Jehovah found upon a nefarious institution and thunderbolts red with vengeance struggled to leap forth and blast the guilty wretches who maintained it. But all was vain. Slavery had stretched its dark wings over death, over the land. The church stood silently by. The priests prophesied falsely, and the people loved to have loved it so. Its slavery throne is established and now reigns triumphantly. In their struggles for human betterment, abolitionists were forced by their convictions 
that there was an infinite worthiness in man. Most Alabama workers worked in some way to implement the teachings of Christianity and therefore prepared the state of perfection. Some, like John A. Collins, George Benson, and Amin Abadou, organized their own perfect practical Christian communities. Most Alabamians, however, like Garnett, were satisfied with the simpler efforts, ones that would harmonize men with God and nature. Garnett attached to the third characteristic was perhaps less strong as attached to the other principles in the reform ideology. It may have been that since he was black and a fugitive slave, he understood more clearly than the others that man had a longer way to go to achieve perfection. Nevertheless, he utilized the perfectibility idea and worked to make slaves aware their status was in the concept. He attempted to show they were a part of the process of creating a heavenly kingdom on earth. Mankind, he informed slaves, are becoming wiser and better. The oppressive power is fading, and you, every day, are becoming more informed and more numerous. The Garrisonian formation of this progress towards the heavenly state caused a considerable controversy. Garrisonian's perfectionists repudiated the church government and other institutes that supported the movement towards a perfectibility by a tact of open or open support of slavery. Garnett criticism of the church had been cited. He did, however, try to appeal to the slave to live according to the gospel. Mrs. Chapman criticism notwithstanding. The divine commandments you are in duly bound in reverence and obey. If you do not obey, you should surely meet the displeasure of the Almighty. He requires you to love him supremely as your neighbor and as yourself, to keep the Sabbath holy, to keep searching the scriptures, and bring up your children with respect for his laws and worship no other God but him. Man, Garnett seemed to have been the slave who was responsible only to God. The drive to a perfectibility dictated a considerable extent in the fourth characteristic of Garsonianism, a dedication to a moral reparation. Abolitionists acting on the premise of the cure of American ills lay in an appeals of consciousness and opportunities of conversion and the cleansing of quality of repentance. Lacking a coordinated program was compensated as such for a moral fever which permeated the declaration of sentiments of the anti American anti slavery society. I trust for victory is solely in God. We may be personally defeated, but our principles never. Truth, justice, reason, humanity must and will gloriously triumph. At every point of his address, Barnett initial attack seemed to appeal to the slave owner's sense of morality. Speaking years, 10 years earlier than the Garnett, a modern custodian abolitionist sold the same moral outrage. The abolitionist, he declared, seeks to impress incredibly upon every human heart the true doctrines of the rights of man, to establish now and forever this great fundamental truth of human liberty, that man cannot hold property in his brethren, for they believe the general mission of this truth will utterly destroy the system of slavery based that the system is the now in this regard of it. Garnett, like most anti-slavery crusaders, accepted the efficacy of the moral reproach and felt that the great moral truths simply had to be disseminated to produce the desired result. Like most black abolitionists, however, he maintained a healthy skepticism about total reliance on philosophical and moral reproach. As will be demonstrated below, Garnett had an alternative, alternative should be a method failed. That Garner had held a moral reproach that at all can be attributed to three factors. First, he was a clergyman and peace advocate. Second, he knew that the intellectual climate of the time would not sanction revolution. Third, and extremely important, like most American reformers, Garnett placed great credence in the idea of progress. In the idea of progress. Whether speaking in political or economic or humanistic terms, analogous implicitly or explicitly unguttered their reform ideology with the concept of progress. It was interlocking thread running throughout. The final characteristic of Alabama reform to be considered here is the individual nature of most reform. Although they sought to validate their ideas by occurring a consensus, they utilized such organizational devices such as local, state, national, international associations. And abundance also seen to, by the need to hold annual conventions and demonstrating views through a variety of newspapers, 
or central borough controlled by societies. There is seen to be a constant stream of activities, speeches, threats, declarations, exposures, gestures, and ideas waiting to be claimed and supported by the universal observation or curious. The imaginary violence in Henry Highland Garnett's words was partially a rhetoric device, but it also suggested a tendency to alibition energy to organize itself for their worldly struggle. The obvious similarities between Garnett's alibitionism and Garrison's alibitionism and Garnett ideas have been demonstrated as they have a distorted historical evaluation of works and overemphasizes its militant factors. It remains to deduce that the actual program of emancipation that Garnett had advocated in his speech. To achieve liberation, Garnett outlined a three-step program. First, slaves, you must approach your master as man and remonstrate with him. You can, Garnett reminded slave, need your own cause and do the work of emancipation better than others. The slave as an alibitionist and an agent of change is an idea clearly originated by Garnett. He realized that the movement towards liberation would provide an opportunity for slaves to assume a variety of roles previously denied by their bondage, and that this grounding of roles would be an excellent preparation for freedom. In addition, the role suggested by Garnett was the labor agitator. He promised them renewed diligence in the cultivation of the soil if they were rendered you an equivalent for your services. The priorities for the action would be reversed by Garnett. Formerly, the slaveholder had to appeal, had been appealed by the abolitionists to remove the yoke of slavery. But Garnett's program called for the transformation of the slave from chattel to catalyst. The justification and role were many, but initially followed a rational, moral approach. If, however, slaves cannot be activated by the beauty of the perfection or the extraction of the God given liberty they had in Garnett's eyes, more concrete reasons to pursue freedom. He felt the continued disregard of slave humanity could, would provide a spark. They could not, if they were in a man, continue to allow their daughters to be pampered by the lust of the masters and overseers. Phase two of Garnett plan a truly militant but non-violent civil disobedience. He advised slaves to cease to toil for heartless turns who give you no other world than stripes and abuse. The general strike was for Garnett to the device that can be utilized by slaves. Three million men refusing to work to completely disrupt the system so that the God-cursed slaveholders will be glad to let them go. Garnett says, suggested such taxes of emancipation later ideas of civil disobedience, particularly those of contemporary Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau deposited that a group of men in pursuit of honest values could affect the coercive operations of the government by refusing its service. On the problem of servility, however, Garnett anticipated the probability of a white backlash. Step three advocated military, militant self-defense. By calling Denmark Vesey, by calling to mind Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, Joe Klink, and Madison Washington, Madison Washington is the Creole fear, you know, the Creole fear and stuff, that's another story I get into. Garnett Holt is still pride in the slaves and strike terrorists into the masters and started to notice that blacks could and would defend themselves. Of the choices available, Garnett leaves little doubt that self-defense is his means. Resistance was necessary because no oppressed people have secure liberty without it. But revolution was emphatically ruled out. Garnett addressed Dick and review must be viewed as a call to arms, but as a plan, as an active that could escalate to bloodshed. Militant self-defense was a bright sign. The prophetic warning, however, was not originally with Garnett. In 1834, John Greenleaf Whitner wrote, the slave will become conscious sooner or later of his strength, his physical superiority, and will exert it. His torch will be at the threshold and his knife at the throat of the planter. Power and indiscriminate will be his vengeance. The particular influence of Garnett's thoughts I consider a prophet warning to the South had to be David Walker. When Garnett published his own address in 1848, he combined it with the reissue of David Walker's 1829 appeal. The address was more than symbolic. It further indicated Garnett's temperance grasp of the contemporary intellectual and occurrence of ability to mold them into his own coherent and personalized statement. Mm, so he, he's going to fight. You know, 
They were needed to issue the issue with Henry Garnett's paper. Hmm. That's it. My bad. That's it. It doesn't mean more than that. So that's what he's just trying to say. So as you see, um, well, that was it. As you see, Frederick Douglass voted against the plan for this plan that Henry Garnett had put forth, you know, about militant self-defense and um, going on it. They was both kind of edgy to call it a revolution, but um, that's one of the things I want to make sure that um, that you look at Frederick Douglass, he voted against the plan and he went against the um, the plan for this, which, you know, was the slaves defending themselves, sending the strike, send self stuff down, they come out and fight us, and we come out and fight them, you know, so. He was against that. And that's why Frederick Douglass is pushed up higher as the one that you know. You don't know about these two cats right here. We're gonna do a video on David Walker's pill just to add more stuff about the um the Frederick Douglass doing the Jim Brown raids and stuff in 1859 when um he was raiding Harper's Ferry. And you know, Jim Brown the story as told by Dr. Claude Anderson. He went around trying to talk to people, they were all in a certain central group. It's ambitious, they all knew each other. Harry Tubman was sick. You know, she had a little conniptions like she had before. She was sick, you know. Well, she, you know, if you read the history of Harry Tubman, she gets sick a lot, you know what I'm saying? So he went to Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, you know what I'm saying? He said no. But on his deathbed, he admitted that he was afraid to do what, you know, John Brown was doing. He was very afraid to do that. So a lot of this that came down with Frederick Douglass when he dissed William Garnett's um, address to the slaves. And you know what I'm saying, the slaves of the United States of America, a lot of that stuff was out of fear. That's why he had been voted it down. Because then, you know, you gotta do more than just talk on that one, baby. And that's why I had to, you know, who's my brother? I met him before, Umar Johnson. I disagree with, you know, his so called ancestor, his ancestor, or his kinsman being the greatest, you know, American person it was. No, he was afraid when it came to push, came to shove, shove, came to push. He was afraid. He wasn't gonna do that shit. You know what I'm saying? He had a limit. And that's why you hear more about that cat than you don't hear about the other ones. Anyway, you know, much love, though, to Henry William Garnett. Hopefully, y'all learned something. Hopefully, y'all learned something. You know, I did. Because people were trying to stop that. We had this stuff going on. People trying to stop it. But, you know, they become our heroes. And the other thing, too, one of y'all noticed, we still kind of follow this, this Garrisonian model today. You know what I'm saying? About moral persuasion. You're not gonna morally, you know, morally just jacking people out of their out of their privilege. You know what I'm saying by making them feel guilty and shit like that. You know, they will change that from being not a sin. You know, they got the power like that. You know what I'm saying? Who who will be that foolish to let you just talk them out and just take their money from their children, their great grandchildren, the children they ain't seen yet before? Because you know you we you feel like you to being oppressed and is morally wrong. There's no people that's gonna do that. You know. That's why they had a civil war. They had to have a civil war. You know, nobody is that stupid enough to do that. I'm sorry. White guilt don't work. That moral persuasion, what well, you still learn today. That's why you still be marching and all type of stuff like that. That Garrisonian, whatever appeal, that's the, that's still, that we still learn today, that don't work. You know what I'm saying? You take the time from there and we still take time from, from where we at today. It, that's, that's just too much. You know what I'm saying? You've been wasting countless of generations going through that. Anywho, you know, Makoska Funny, subscribe to the channel, like the video, show some love. Peace.